And tonight I'm going to talk to you from the subject I'd like to entitle this eight major things. I say things that evil spirit attach itself to. This is very important. You got to hear this. And I'm going to try to take my time and teach this thing to you. But I'm, I'm, I've got just a little time, so you're going to have to take notes and listen very attentively because these are some things that, listen, folks, we're, we're the last generation. How many of you know that? We're it. Look at your neighbor and say, we're it. We're the last generation before the return of the Lord. And one of the things that we've got to understand is that Jesus is cleaning up his church. You follow what I'm saying? Jesus is clean and the Bible tells us that he washes and cleanses us with the washing of water by the word. And so he's cleaning up his church. The little spots and the blemishes in our lives, the Lord is trying to clean these things up. Amen? Amen? Are you with me? Because folks, to be honest with you, when he comes back, the Bible says he's coming back for a church without spot or without blemish. And so the spots and the blemishes in our lives that the Lord's been dealing with us about, not only you and myself as well, every one of us, we have blemishes that the Lord wants to deal with in our lives. And this is going to help us and just going to generally give us a backdrop of what's really going on in the scene, behind the scenes, or can I say that, behind the scenes. Because you have got to understand that there's eight major things. And these are not the only things, but these are things that the enemy attaches itself to. Now, let me tell you the backdrop about this particular message. Have you ever heard of a fly? <laughs> How many of you know what a fly is? wish I had a picture, I would show you a picture of a fly up there, but a fly, a regular household fly, is something that is very nasty. You know, I know that people just think, oh, it's just a house fly, but let me tell you some things about a fly tonight. You're going to say, the next time you see a fly, you're going to make sure that you swat it away. You don't want a, a, a fly in your house because it carries diseases and it carries germs. How many of you ever heard of the term basilbub or beazelboo? That's a biblical word. You understand what I'm saying? That word beazelbub is given to Satan. It is the prince of devils. And it's the, Jew, the Jews called the God of Ekron, which is a heathen deity whom the Jews ascribe the sovereignty of the evil underworld or evil spirits. And it means the Lord of the flies or the Lord of the dung. If you know where flies multiply and where they are actually, um, they breed is, is in dung. They're birthed out of dung. You follow what I'm saying? Are you with me? So therefore, when you hear the word or the term Beelzebub, you're hearing something that's called the Lord of the Flies or the Lord of the Dung. How many of you know what dung is? Everybody know what dung is, right? The Lord of the doo-doo is the doo-doo God. Are you with me? You know, there's nothing good about doo-doo except fertilizer. Are you with me? So basically, let me share something with you about a, uh, just a, regu a regular house fly. You know, house flies are recognized as carriers of communicable diseases. Flies collect pathogens on their legs and on their mouths when females lay eggs on decomposing organic matter such as feces, garbage, and animal corpses, the things you don't want to deal with. You follow what I'm saying? That's where the female lays the eggs and that's where flies are birthed out of. A household fly carries diseases in their legs and the small hairs that covers their bodies. It takes only a matter of seconds for them to transfer these pathogens to food or touch surfaces. Mature houseflies use a saliva to liquefy solids before feeding on it. During this process, they transfer the pathogens first collected by the landing of offal. The word is O-F-F-A-L. Now, the diseases carried by houseflies include typhoid, cholera, and dysentery. And other diseases carried by the household flies include salmonella, anthrax, and tuberculosis. House flies have been known to transmit eggs of parasitic worms. So you got to understand the next time you see a fly, you need to swat that fly and keep that fly out of your food. Keep that fly out of your house. Let me tell you something. When a fly comes into my house, everything goes on. I mean, I'm trying to tell you, um, that's it. I've got to get that fly out. That's the mode of operandi right there. When I see a fly, I got to get that fly out of here. Why? Because I know its source. Amen. Are you with me? Amen. Now, if Beelzebub or Satan the chief of demons is called the Lord of the flies, the Lord of the demons. You know what you need to do? You need to make sure that no demons have foothold in your life. Are you with me? Don't get nervous. We're talking about demons. We need to talk about these things because, listen, let me tell you something. Demon spirits are real. They are very real. And we're going to begin to see an escalation of demon spirits and demonic activities in the world. 
I'm telling you there are things that are going on in the world as far as demon activity is concerned that you would make your head spin. Things that people are getting involved in. Amen. Hallucinogenic drugs and things like that. We'll talk about that in a few minutes, but I got to get you to understand that these things are the things that you and I need to make sure that our lives are clean and free of. Are you with me? You with me? Okay, good. Let's go into it. Now, the first thing I want to talk to you about when talking about evil spirits is this. Um, G Genesis chapter 4, verse number 7. Remember the story about how the Bible talks about there were two brothers, the first boys. Uh, you know, Adam and Eve uh, had uh, sons and their name were Cain and Abel. And the Bible tells us that it came to pass in the process of time that, uh, that Cain brought, uh, uh, Abel rather, brought an offering that was acceptable unto God. And the Bible says, and Cain brought an offering. Well, what, what, what um, Abel bought was a sacrifice. The Bible says he brought the first of the fat. In other words, he killed the sacrifice. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. He did what God required him to do. However, his brother Cain, he did not bring what God required. And as a result, the Bible said when he came into God's presence, his countenance had fallen. And now notice what the Bible says in, the, in verse number four. He says, if you do well, will not your offering be accepted and if you do not do well sin crouches at your door and it is desire is to rule over you but you must master over it let me read it to you in another translation in the amplified bible it says if you do well meaning believing me and doing what is acceptable and pleasing to me will you not be accepted and if you do not well but ignore my instruction sin crouches the CEV, which is the common English version, says it's waiting to attack you like a lion at your door. And its desire is to, for you to overpower you, but you must master over it. Understand what it says. Sin lies at the door, and God is saying its desire is to master you. But he says, but you must master it. You know what that tells me? At the beginning of the book, God is already telling us that we have the power to resist sin. It's a matter of choice, what you choose to do. You don't have to. Notice, the, the devil did not come to Eve in the garden and put a gun to her head and said, eat it or die. No, he only suggested. How many of you know that suggestions to do things that are wrong comes to your mind first? And then you act on the thought that was planted in your mind. That, might, that thought may not have even come from you, but guess what? It could have come from an outside source, which is the enemy, and when he plants a thought in your mind, you have a split second to think about whether you're going to act on it or not. But you have the power to overcome it. You have the power to master it. Can you shout amen? Amen. So listen to this. The Bible says sin crouches at the door. It says it crouches, waiting to attack you like a lion. In other words, it is set, it's in, in ready to pounce on you like a lion is ready to pounce on his prey. That's how sin is ready for you. Before we get out of this church tonight, guess what? Some of us are going to be tempted. We're going to be pounced on. But what are you going to do as a result? Hello, somebody. Good God Almighty. Y'all quiet tonight. Talking about sin. Yeah, what is sin? What is sin? We hear about this word all the time. What is sin? The Bible says that sin is transgression of the law. Now, I know some of you are going to stone me for saying what I'm about to say. If Christ did away with the law, then there's no such thing as sin. Think about it. If sin is transgression against the law of God, put a pause in it. What is crime? Transgression against the law of man. There is no such thing as a kingdom of God without laws. Every kingdom has laws to abide by, for the citizens to abide by. And so in the kingdom of God, there are laws. And most people around here talking about Christ has done away with the law, don't even know what the law says. You never even took the five, first five books of the Bible in Moses, in, 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 uh, first book, five books of Moses and read it. The law is not bad. Amen. You follow what I'm saying? I mean, in other words, it, it was something that was placed, put in place to tell people how to relate to God and how to relate to one another. I took the time to read it and I found out, you know what? That's what the Bible means when it says Christ have redeemed us from the curse of the law. The curse of the law is that if you were to break the law, the curse came on you. Do y'all understand what I'm That's what he redeemed us from. But the thing about it is the Bible says he's redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For as it is written, cursed is he that hangeth on the tree, right? 
Understand, folks, but Jesus came that he may, call, he may save us and redeem us and put his righteousness in us and his Holy Spirit in us so that we can keep the righteous demands of the law. That means love your neighbor as you love yourself. That's the law. That's in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Love God, love your neighbor as you love yourself. That's the highest law that Jesus said. And that is fulfilling the laws of God in the earth. You follow what I'm saying? So sin is transgression against the law. If I love you, I won't steal from you. If I love you, I won't talk about you. Because the Shema says that, listen, the love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And whatever is hateful to you, don't do to somebody else. Do y'all understand what I'm saying? So sin is transgression against the law. When you do something against the law, then you commit a crime, right? So if you transgress the law of God, you commit sin. That's all sin is, transgression against the law. So if there's no law in place, guess what? You can't transgress. Amen. That's good, That's good. Uh, okay, let's go on. Yeah. <sighs> the scripture says, listen to another scripture. This may help you. The scripture says, whosoever committed sin transgresses also the law. That's New Testament. That ain't Old Testament. He says, for sin is the transgression of the law. Now, 1 John 3 and 4 says that. Now, let me, take, let me take a little twist on it because while we're talking about sin, the reason why I'm talking about this is because the first thing you got to understand is this, is that this is something that the enemy attaches itself to. It attaches itself to lust. Amen. Are you with me? Amen. Write that down. Write it down. Put it on your iPad. Put it on, tweet it. Google it. Something. <laughs> what else? Facebook it, Instagram it, do whatever you have to do. Put it in your memory because that's the thing, lust. And what is lust? Nothing but a strong, uncompulsive desire to obtain something that's forbidden. And there's some things that we lust of is permissible, but when you want that more than you want to obey God, then it becomes lust. Okay. All right, let's keep going. I'm going to tiptoe a little bit here. Let's talk about lust. What is it? An overwhelming desire or craving. It, is a, it has its focus in pleasing oneself. You follow what I'm saying? It often leads to unwholesome actions to fulfill one's desire with no result or no rather regard to the consequences. In other words, it's about me. It is a gratification that is unrestrained. It's called lasciviousness. And many of us suffer from that. Hello? He said, keep saying hello, who's he talking to? I just want to make sure you're here. <laughs> Listen to this. Lust is about possession and greed. Covetousness, never enough. Always want. Oh, you're never satisfied. The Bible says, having food and raiment, therewith we ought to learn to be what? Content. Uh-oh, maybe I'm in the wrong church tonight. I don't get content with nothing. I'm going to get everything I can possibly get. No, 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 no. You got to understand, when you get something, see, that's why the Bible reminds us about the love of money. Because one thing about money, the more you get, the more you want. Because money has a way of making you feel secure. You follow what I'm saying? It makes you, uh, you, when you get one million, then you want two million. You get two million, you want five million. You get five million. See, it's never enough. It just continued because, see, I understand when Jesus said that God's greatest competitor is not the enemy. God's greatest competitor is mammon. Amen. He said you cannot serve God in what? Mammon. Mammon is more than just money or a dollar. Doll a dollar or money is just neutral. You understand what I'm saying? D money is neutral because the thing about it is whatever. Listen, if you put a million dollars in, in, a, in a man who is a, who is a, 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 a <laughs> okay, let's put it this way. Let's be nice, okay? Let's be nice. You put a million dollars in the man, uh, uh, hands of a man who's a drunkard, what is he going to do? He just take drunk being drunk to the next level. Amen. One time before he was a five dollar drunk, now he's, got a, he's a million dollar drunk. Why? Because money magnifies who you are. So it's neutral. Does that make sense to you? So the thing about it is the more you have, the more you want. And the thing about it, God is saying you got to learn contentment because when you learn contentment, that means they would not have the chance to lord over you. Because the thing about it is, is that when you're not content, then you forsake God and you start running after that instead of running after God who gives you all things to enjoy. 
You follow what I'm saying? So it's called lust. Now, listen to this. The Bible says in 2 Peter that lust, or let's say it this way. The Bible says this. He says corruption is in the world through lust. Let me explain that to you. The scripture says we have been, we, here it is, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. What do you mean, Reverend? Here it is, is that people steal, they kill. They do all kinds of murderous things and hideous things because of what? Because they want more money. Why does the pimp put the girls out in the street to prostitute them? Why does, why does men traffic young ladies and young men? For what? For money. So they're corrupted themselves because they wanted more what? Money. Why do they need more money? Because they want to live good. They want to live secure. Because this, that's why, G my God, Kenneth, that's why Jesus calls it the deceitfulness of riches. It's called the false glamour. The word deceitful means false glamour. It paints a picture of security, but it really doesn't make you secure. Because the thing about it is that some of the people with all of the money, they are... If you had the money that Michael Jackson had, guess what? He just wanted a good night's sleep. But he had money. Do y'all understand what I'm saying? So don't let nobody fool you, folks. It is the love of money. And the Bible tells us, he said, to flee the things from the love of money. He said, to pursue the things that are after God, righteousness and faithfulness and holiness and all of these things, because those things pay off. They pay great dividends. He said, godliness with contentment is great gain, having not only promise in this world, but in the world that is to come. Now, that's scripture. Amen. That's the word. So we, we, we got to understand when we have an uncontrolled desire to have something and to own something or to possess something, then we open the door to demons. Because let me tell you something, saints of God. Let me tell you very, very hear me pretty, please hear me. It was the enemy that came to Jesus and said, all these things I will give you if you just bow down and worship me. And there's a lot of preachers and pulpits today and churches today that have sold out to the devil just to get the gain. When God can find a man, like our pastor, that ain't running after money, Amen. he can use that man. Amen. And that's one of the hardest tests to pass in the kingdom of God. Amen. The devil used it on Jesus. I'll give you all of this stuff. How many men that have fallen today because of greed? Not only, <laughs> someone put it this way, girls, Gold and glory. Amen. Do y'all know what that means? Men, great men. David asked the question of Saul, how are the mighty fallen? Mighty men and women of God have fallen because of what? Gals or guys, gold, which is money, and what? Glory, pride. So the enemy wants to attack us in those areas. So we got to make sure. The Bible says, you remember the scripture tells us in the, oh Lord Jesus. 16 minutes, and I'm still on that one. Let's go to the next one. <laughs> I can't do it all. Can't do it all. Unforgiveness and bitterness. Say, I'm going to use those two together. Unforgiveness and bitterness. Say, that's the second thing. The second thing the enemy attaches itself to. This is very important. Got to listen to it. Mark 11, chapter, verse number 25. Jesus said, and when you stand praying, forgive. If you have ought against anything, any." that your Father also which is in heaven may forgive you your trespasses. Next verse says this, but if you do not forgive, neither will your Father which is in heaven forgive your trespasses. You see that? Turn to the next scripture here. And, and like y'all got the notes, right? Matthew 11, cha uh, 18th chapter rather. Let's look at verse number 21. Let me show you something here. Then Peter came to him and said, Lord, how often shall I forgive my brother that sins against me? And I, f I forgive him rather, till seven times. Jesus said unto him, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. Glory to God. Therefore the kingdom of heaven is likened unto a certain king which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon one was brought unto him which owe him ten thousand talents, but for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold and his wife and his children all that he had and payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, we've have patience with me, I'll pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants which owed him a hundred pence. And he laid his hands on him and took him by the throat saying, pay me what thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him saying, have patience with me, I'll pay thee all. And he would not. 
Say he would not. not. Didn't say he could not, say he would not. not. Stop right there. That was a choice, an action of his will, not his ability. His ability wasn't in question. His will is in question here. And he would not but went and cast them into prison until he should pay the debt. Next verse. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sore and came and told their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called them, said unto them, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt because you desired me. Should have not thou have also compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth and delivered him to the, to the who? Do you see that word tormentors? What does that sound like to you? That sounds like something that's in the demonic realm, right? The tormentors till she, he should pay all that was due unto him. Next verse. So likewise, say so likewise, shall my heavenly father do also unto you if you do not from your heart forgive every one of his brother their trespasses. That's why I says unforgiveness and bitterness. Because when you don't forgive, it turns into bitterness. It festers on the inside of you. Because listen, unforgiveness leaves the door open to Satan. Listen, we just talked about it just a minute ago. Sin crouches at the door. It is crouching, it is set, it's ready to pounce. And when you allow yourself to be operating in unforgiveness, that's what happens. The enemy comes in and he starts setting shop like the flies come in and start laying eggs. And lays more eggs and lays more eggs. And that stuff is birthed in you. You cannot afford to operate in unforgiveness. You don't know what that person did. I don't need to know what the person did to you. Look at what we did to God. Yet he put all the sins of mankind on his son and forgave you your trespasses. And now he says, ought you not to forgive your brother their trespass? I forgave you all your debt. What sin did not get clean when you got born again? Tell me, what sin did you do that you did not get cleansed from when you got born again? Because you asked God to forgive you, he forgave you. So when somebody comes and asks you, well, well, they didn't come and ask me. They acting like, they acting like, you know what, ain't nothing happened. That's all right. What did he tell us to do anyway? Forgive. If you have aught against any. I'm burning up up here. And I think it's because I'm preaching somebody out of hell right now. <laughs> Hebrews 12. I'm telling you something, folks. I don't want to go to hell. I have made a decision. If y'all don't go, don't hinder me. I'm not going to hell behind Charmaine Dentley, Kenneth Dentley Jr., Christian Dentley, Kelly Dentley, uh, Resnova. I ain't going behind none of them folks. I am not going to hell. You know why? Because Jesus came to pay the price that I can go and live with him in heaven. And I'm not invited there, so I'm not going to a party that I'm not invited to. Unforgiveness will turn you over to the tormentors in this life. People can't get healed because of unforgiveness. People can't be delivered because of unforgiveness. You follow what I'm saying? You 80 something years old, calling sister so-and-so to your bedside in the hospital because you're about to take your last breath. Call Sister Anna. Call Sister Anna. Tell her she need to come see me. He said, Mama, why you want Sister Anna? I got to talk to her. Sister Anna shows up. She's 80-something too. Miss <laughs> Anna, please forgive me. I never forgave you for taking my husband. 30 something years ago. <laughs> Said, well, actually, it was 50 something years ago because we've been seeing one another 20 years before then. You find me. <laughs> I shouldn't have said that. So I call you here to forgive you, now I'm going to kill you. You know, but no, <laughs> but no. But here she is about to take her last breath, and all those years she wasted time holding on to an offense. Because somebody took your what? Excuse me. 
nobody is worth going to hell over. And you should never give anybody power in your life. It's in you. See, it turns into bitterness. Hebrews chapter 12 says this. Listen, well, let me tell you what bitterness is before we go any further. Bitterness keeps the incident or the hurt alive. It keeps the injury alive and fresh as if it just happened moments ago. Reliving that hurt of the past along with the current problems of the day, it's like a backlog. You know what it is? It's constipation. <laughs> How many of y'all have ever been constipated before? It ain't a good feeling, right? You're backed up. <laughs> oh, Lord, help us, Jesus. What are you backed up with? You know, we got a saying of it, you're full of, oh, I didn't say it. See, y'all thought I was going to go there. No, I don't do that. You are full of manure or full of dung. You know what it is? If you get backed up too long, you will be full of demons. Amen. Because Jesus taught us when an unclean spirit go out of a man, he goes seek and rest, find none. He go back to the house in which he came out of, and he said, I will return. He comes and find it swept and garnished and everything, put in order. But then the Bible said he go and gather seven other demon spirits more wicked than himself. And then the, they come and they dwell in the man, and the second state of the man is worse than what? The first. That's what happens to this generation. i got to get you to understand, people, when you refuse to forgive and you let bitterness settle on the inside of you, guess what happened? You are backed up. You're constipated. You are full of devils. Amen. And you need to be free. And they get to a place whereby sometimes you can't do it yourself. They have to take your butt hind to the hospital and they got to put something up you and actually there are people today, they have to actually go up there. I'm sorry, I know it sounds bad, but they have to go up and they have to pull that stuff, that fecal tissue out of them because it's so hardened. You understand what I'm saying? See, the, the body is trying to teach us something here, a spiritual lesson. You cannot fool with unforgiveness. The Bible talks about in the Hebrews chapter 12, follow peace with all men and holiness without no man shall see the Lord. The next one says, looking diligent, diligently, lest any fall of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up and trouble you, and therefore many be defiled. Why? Just by your one bitter tone. When you're bitter with a pastor, you go and spread your bitterness through the church and everybody else get bitter because you are bitter. It's like a cancer. It spreads. And I got six minutes left. Oh, man. So let's go to the next one. Hurts and wounds. Look at somebody and say, hurts and wounds. <laughs> Got to speed it up. Just like the physical body. I just said that a minute ago. When, injury, when injured, it is susceptible to what? Infection. Cut your skin. What's going to happen? It's susceptible to infection. So is the soul of man. It works the same way. The antibodies in our body, if strong, will fight off the infection until all have been removed, thus allowing the injury to heal. But if not, the place of injury can become infected, cause pain, amputation of a limb, or even what? Death. Remember what Jesus said? If something offends you in the body, cut it off. Hello, somebody. It's better you, for you to enter into life whole than to enter into hell with all of your body parts intact. That's what he told us. That's what the Lord taught us. So hurts and wounds. What happens when we're hurt? The thing is not the, the problem that we're hurt. Every one of us, you, not, you will not live in this world without being hurt. How many of you found that out already? You're going to be hurt by loved ones. You're going to be hurt by kin folks. You're going to be hurt by parents at times. You're going to be hurt by pastors and leaders, spiritual. Folks, guess what? You know, we live in a world that Jesus said, it is impossible, but offenses will come. In other words, he's saying, it's not possible to live in this world without having the opportunity to be offended or to be wounded or to be injured. Come on, folks, wake up. People on the job, they will injure you. So what do you do? The question is, how do you respond after you've been injured? I'm not mad at anybody here. I hope you ain't think I'm fussing with you. I'm sorry. I'll, I'll tone it down a little bit. <laughs> the worst thing you can do is blame others. Blame somebody else. 
Well, if you wouldn't have done this, I wouldn't have done that. No, 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 no. Own up to your own responsibility. If you wouldn't have hurt me, I wouldn't have hurt you, so therefore that makes it right? No, it doesn't. Injuries come to every one of us, even as children. You know, I got scars on my body right now from when I was a child. And some things right now I can go back and I can tell you exactly what happened, what I was doing, the foolishness I was doing. Chances are we've been doing something that we weren't supposed to be doing or someplace where we shouldn't have been or whatever, climbing somebody's tree so they can, we can rob their pear tree or something like that and got a scar or a bruise or something like that. A nick, come on, everybody has that, right? Amen. Even in our human body, we can see where we had some injury. Some of you have had broken limbs before. You played sports or something, you broke a limb or whatever. We all have had injuries. But that's a part of life. And God uses those injuries, folks, I'm trying to tell you, to get us to the cross, the place that we don't want to go. And the cross is good for us because the cross is that thing that will kill the flesh so that the Spirit of God may live. Can you shout amen? I got to go. I got to go. I got to go. I got to go. So listen to this. Stop blaming others. Look at somebody and say, stop blaming others. It speeds up the healing process. Do you not know in the book of Corinthians, Paul said to this, why don't you, you got, why are you guys fighting one another? Can't you just take wrong? Did not our Lord take all of the wrong? For us? Hello? So watch somebody hurt your feelings. My wife hurt my feelings all the time. I'm still married after 21 years. <laughs> I'm sorry, sweetheart. That don't matter. That, 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 that I'm just playing with her. But anyway, no. But, but sometimes we hurt one another's feelings, but we're still married. We get through it. It took me a long time to get to the place whereby I would recover. I mean, it used to take me two to three days to recover, but now I'm uh, probably three hours now. I'm, I cut it down to three hours now. <laughs> I don't bounce back like she does. You know, she'll go in the room or whatever, and I don't know, maybe the Holy Ghost get on her or something like that, and then she'll come out and she'll apologize. And it took me a long time to do that, but I learned how to be quick to forgive through my wife. She taught me that. I saw that in her. I saw that in her example. <laughs> Hello. And so, folks, you got to be quick to forgive, quick to release, let people go. Amen. Am I talking to somebody in here? If I'm talking to you, wave your hand at me. Oh, I'm in the right place today. Okay, okay, okay. I keep going. So, so, folks, stop blaming others. It heals up the speed, it speeds up the healing process. And not only that, don't hold on to the offense. Let it go. Look at somebody and say, let it go. Is that what the little girls say on, um, on um, what's, what's the, the Disney thing? Frozen, that's right. Let it go. <laughs> Look at your neighbor and say, let it go. Preacher, that's easy for you to say, but you don't know what somebody did to me. Well, let me, um, let me let you know. Listen, 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 listen. Can I help you right here? That's why you have the Holy Spirit. He's called the Spirit of Grace. Now, what is the Spirit of Grace? Grace is God's ability to enable you to do what you cannot do in your own strength. The Bible says the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. What that's saying to me is that I have grace to go through it. There's a lot of things in the New Testament Jesus said that we should do in the kingdom as being kingdom citizens. Somebody slapped you on the cheek, turn the other cheek also. Now, how many of you know that's hard to do? <laughs> the Bible says lend without expecting nothing in return. How many of you know that's hard to do? But God gives us the grace to do it. He gives us the ability by giving us the Holy Spirit. Even though it hurts, God will bring us to a place where I believe say, I know this thing hurts, but you know what? If my enemy hungers, I'm going to feed him because the grace of God comes on the inside of us to enable us to do what we can't do in our own strength. That's what makes us different from people of the world. People, church, uh-oh, so they're coming up. So that means that my time... <laughs> Can I give you this one? John 20 and 23. Can you get that one up there quicker? Quick, 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 quick. John 20, 23. Notice what he says. When Jesus first returned to the disciples, the Bible says he, he walked in the room, breathed on them and said, receive ye the Holy Spirit. As the Father sent you, sent me, so I send you. And this is the very next thing he said. He said, whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them, and whosoever sins you retain, they are returned. You know what that mean? That means the word remit means to, okay. Everyday occurrence. Well, we get bills in the mail. You remember the bill that says send remittance now? You know what they're saying? Send it away from you. Send the money away from you. That's what the word remit means. It means to send away. So when you are tempted to be offended, 
God is saying here, whosoever sins you retain, if you hold the sin, it will be held. But he said, but if you sin it away, it will be sent away. So that means you have the power to do it. You remember? Sin lieth at the door, but you should master over it. Oh, Jesus. The next one, contracts and agreements. I can't do that one tonight, okay? Contracts and agreements. Let me tell you about the contracts and agreements. Have you ever made a contract with yourself? Have you ever said to yourself, nobody will ever do me like that again? Nobody will ever treat me like that again? Can I give you all a little short story? Short story. True story, too. I had this one little girl in high school that I used to love so much. I love this girl, man. I, I love this girl. But she always made me jealous. She always she'd be hugging up my best friend and stuff like that. We, go, we, we, sang on, we were on the band together. And every time, you know, it's a, a common thing that boyfriend and girlfriend sit together on the band bus when we go to trips and things like that. Well, she would grab my friend and say, come on, sit by me. And I would pass by. I'd be so heartbroken, so jealous. So jealous. This girl did this so many times to me. You know what? I made a contract in my, my mind. I said, you know what? I'll never let nobody treat me like that again. How many of you have done that before? You know what happened? The enemy used that to cause me to start having multiple girlfriends. What do you mean multiple girlfriends? Always got a chick on the side. Why? Because if you act crazy, I still got Susie over here. <laughs> it started that way, but it kept going. It kept going on and on and on until it destroyed my first marriage. It's real. Contracts and agreements. The little things you've said. The little things that you've said. The agreement that you made with other people. You tell that man on your phone, I'll love you forever. Nothing will ever break us up. And now he's married to somebody else and you're still holding on and you still got a piece of him because of a contract that's binding and legal. And the enemy comes before God and says they have a right because this is what they declared. I wish I had time to go through all of this because the thing about it is I can tell you all of this, but I got to show you how it can be broken in your life and you don't have to have somebody spitting on you to do it. Amen. Okay, all right. Occult practices, spells, drugs, and curses. I can't go through that either. The word drugs, every time you say drugs ain't in the Bible, oh yes it is. When the Bible speaks of, in the book of uh, Galatians, when it talks about witchcraft, you ever seen that? You know, the, will somebody answer that for me? <laughs> Thank you. When you see the word witchcraft in the Bible, that is speaking of drug use. That word is the Greek word pharmakia. We get our word pharmacy from it. So it's talking about drug use. Even in the book of Revelation, when the Bible talks about the people did not repent of their sorceries, that means they did not repent of their drug use. Back in the day, listen, they had to use that word witchcraft because it was only the witch doctors that used to use potions back in the day, around 400 years ago. So that's the word that they used. If it was translated today, it would be translated drug use. But they call it witchcraft because the witch doctors were the only one that had magic potions and spells and medicine, medicinal medicines. Y'all understand what I'm saying? That's that, during the time the King James Version was written. So you got to understand that when you mess around with drugs, people, you are especially hallucinogenic drugs. I think I pronounced that right, yeah? Hallucinogenic drugs. And so when you, it invokes evil spirits to come and show you things and speak to you and give you a trip and you want to go again. And you go, and they're digging you deeper into the occult. Idols and relics. Idols and relics. What do you mean idols and relics? You got to be very careful what you buy in stores and bring to your home. What you allow someone to give to you. This is what the note says. The note says, demons will at times attach itself to relics and idols, bringing curses on the person or the house that the person claimed that the relic was, rather was given, stolen, or bought. Be very careful when you go to other countries or somebody go to other countries and bring things back to you. As innocent as it may be, demon spirits attach themselves to those things. Can't do it, can't get through it right now, but there's many scriptures that can support that and, and, and anger. Let's say anger. anger. The Bible says, be angry, sin not. You remember, Cain slew his brother because of anger. Amen. The Bible says, make no friendship with an angry man and with a fierce man. Do not go lest you learn his ways. Don't hang around angry people. You learn how to get angry too. Are you with me? Amen. Some of us are products of angry parents. 
And the last one is pride. Say pride. pride. That is the sin. Sin was the first sin was the pride of Lucifer. It led to his downfall. He used it to cause the fall of the first parents, Adam and Eve. He also used this to cause the fall of many Israelite leaders as well as their kings. He did use it in the wilderness to tempt the Lord Jesus Christ. However, he did not succeed because Jesus, um, um, Ed, please, humbled himself. That's the antidote for pride, humility. And I gotta tell you this right here, folks, because this is very, 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 very important. Here's the things, the symptoms of pride, symptoms of pride. You follow what I'm saying? You keep getting a headache and keep getting a headache or whatever is telling you something's wrong someplace else. That's symptoms, not the cause. Here's this. Listen to me very carefully. Ego. Vanity. How much time do you spend in the mirror? Whoa. Self-righteousness. Haughtiness. Importance. Arrogance. Intellectualism. Rationalization. And they had to throw this one in there. Stuck upness. Yeah. You stuck up? Yeah, you, you're full of pride. Here, guys, and this is why y'all hear me talk about sports a lot. Competition. It's not of God. Drivenness. Argumentative. These are all symptoms of pride. So if you, uh, in any of these categories, if you find these things constantly playing in your life, you have that and that's the thing that causes the fall of Lucifer. So what have we learned from this lesson tonight? We learned, number one, that sin lieth at the door. And our desire is to master or rule over it. The scripture tells us in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 27, give no place to the devil. Amen. The third thing that we do is we submit ourselves to God. Listen, you can't, you can't resist the devil, folks, if you don't submit yourself to God. There are many people around here talking about the Bible says, resist the devil and he'll flee. No, understand, you've got to submit yourself to God first. When you submit, that means you come under the authority of God first and his word. And then you're able to resist the devil and he will flee. And the Bible tells us that we've got to resist steadfast in the faith. That means that we've got to constantly, we've got to be steadfast as our resistance against the enemy. We can't Resist today and fall tomorrow and resist next week and fall the week after. We have got to do this on a continuous basis. And last but not least, we must renounce. Everyone say renounce. Yeah. That word means to give up a claim, a right, or a belief by a formal public statement. Give up a pursuit, a practice, a way of living or feeling. It means to cast off or to disown, to refuse further association with, to repudiate or to reject the hidden works of darkness and stand in your freedom by walking in the spirit and not fulfilling the desires of your flesh. Everyone stand, please. <clears throat> eight things. Eight things. Eight things. Eight things. There's more than that, but these are the major things that the Lord... Knows.